Hey everyone, thanks for uh, joining us this evening. Thanks uh, for being part of the uh, first RFS uh, annual business meeting. Um, I'm uh, Ali Alikani. I'm, I'm the 2016-2017 um, RFS chair, working with an outstanding team, uh, which will be introduced shortly. Uh, I just a quick uh, summary about me. I'm an R2 from the University of Tennessee. Um, Health Science Center in Memphis, and uh, I basically will, will serve for one year. Um, coming up, I took over for Dave Tabriz, um, who was an outstanding chair last year, uh, and I have definitely have big shoes to fill. And uh, I hope that I don't disappoint my uh, my amazing team this year. Um, just want to give you a quick uh, summary of what. So the RFS is the uh, resident fellow section or student section of. SIR. Just a quick big picture, the Society of Interventional Radiology has several divisions. Um, one of the divisions, uh, one of the managing divisions is called Graduate Medical Education. Um, and um, under this division, there is a, there's a committee called the Student Resident Committee, um, aka SARC. The RFS is a subcommittee of that um, main Society of Interventional Radiology committee with a mission to promote the uh, clinical model of interventional radiology um, and uh, basically educate the residents, um, fellows and students, and also recruit um, resident fellows and students to work towards expanding our knowledge base of the disease processes that we, um, that we manage as interventional radiologists. Um, we've definitely um, want to kick up uh, the uh, intensity of uh, RFS uh, in the last year and this year and years to come, especially because of the new interventional radiology residency that had a very successful match this year. So our job is going to be even more important uh, this year and, and years uh, to come. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just want to kind of introduce you to some of my initiatives for this year. Um, basically, my number one initiative is to further the RFS mission, which is uh, promoting the clinical model of IR and education, as I mentioned, um, and also continue to promote the IR residency um, and follow the IR clinical model. So we're more, uh, so interventional radiologists, as you know, with the IR residency, you're transitioning into uh, clinicians versus uh, consult services and or, and or other uh, type of uh, titles that we've had in the past. It's very important for us to become clinicians and manage patients um, from admission to discharge as a whole. And that's something that the society and the RFS is working uh, very closely to do through education and recruitment. Um, <clears throat> uh, Another initiative I'm having is uh, supporting, the, obviously supporting the RFS, supporting um, all of my committee chairs and uh, my service line chairs, uh, being kind of the liaison between everybody and being able to help as much as I can um, to collaborate with SIR. Um, one of the one of the uh, most recent collaborations we've had with the society and, and the attendings is um, one of them reached out to us to ask for uh, any RFS members to help their committees, their SIR committees, with some quality measure, uh, quality measure uh, definitions for interventions in dialysis. Um, so that's something that was were very exciting. And some of our members are engaged with the attendings directly in some of their projects. Um, so that's that's something that I definitely want to focus on as well. Um, and also continue the RFS projects that we have that we're, we're about to talk about um, during the next hour throughout all of all committees and service lines. Um, some, of the, some quick examples, which again, we'll review. Uh, shortly uh, of successful past projects is a universal curriculum for several IR related clinical rotations to again promote that clinical model of IR and those curriculums involve the ICU and surgical um, curriculums and RFS is working to come up with these curriculums and, and promote them to medical students and residents to have them basically go through these rotations before they start um, either their fellowships and or during the IR residency obviously. Um, clinical lecture series, um, an FAQ section regarding uh, new IR residency, IR quarterly articles, a stronger social media presence. As we know, it's very important for promotion and SIR Connect, which is a social media platform we use on the SIR website. Uh, figure one quick hits, cases online, in training seasonal newsletter, case series, IR survival guides and journal primers, IR practice building initiatives, um, advocacy and SERPAC awareness and congressman visits, and uh, Stronghold Medical Student Recruitment and Expanded Medical Student IR Interest Groups. These are some of the previous successful projects and or some very successful ongoing projects um, that we'll definitely be 
talking about soon. Um, <clears throat> quickly, obviously, we have a website. Please visit it. It has history, um, news, education. Also, now we have an online application for um, RFS uh, interested uh, trainees that want to join. They can just fill out the application and um, go through the selection process. Um, quickly, I, I explained the SIR uh, management and the subcommittee is now RFS has its own structure as well, which um, each chair of the committee will speak shortly. Uh, basically, there's the chair, that's me, uh, working with an amazing group of uh, committee members, um, I'm sorry, committee chairs, members, and service line members and chairs. We have the membership council, uh, the annual meeting committee, the advocacy committee, women in IR committee, communications, medical student council, recruitment committee, in training pathways committee, and clinical education committee. And new members can uh, work with any of these committees under service lines, by the way. So that's something that's determined once you apply and go through the um, uh, process um, and tell us what your interests are, and we'll be able to match you with the appropriate uh, service. Um, the membership council committee, as you can see, has a um, basically oversees the service lines, um, and we have six service lines here, which we'll discuss. Uh, medical student section structure, there's a chair um, and uh, different uh, subcommittees and uh, subcommittees responsibilities, which will be explained shortly. And going on, just quickly, the RFS governing council term cycle. Uh, basically, uh, the, we, we hold elections um, through a application service um, to, become an, to become a governing council, council member. And you basically start to transition into the role in fall and winter um, of the year that you apply. And then you basically go to the fall and winter of the following year. Um, and then your official terms begin the, during, from annual meeting to annual meeting. However, um, if you become a GC uh, chair, basically you start to kind of shadow the previous chair during that fall winter. And then you take over officially from the annual meeting. <clears throat> this is the current... Uh, in the, uh, the following year's uh, GC uh, members here, and they'll all be speaking. This is the previous year's. And we have our faculty uh, mentor, uh, Dr. Josie Vatican Cherry from uh, Kaiser Permanente in Los Angeles, who joins us frequently, and uh, we're very close with, and we work very closely with him, and very thankful for his uh, all of his efforts towards RFS. Uh, quick 2015-2016 uh, accomplishments, um, uh, just real quick again, we're going to go over them. The medical student interest and um, recruitment, we've had uh, IR interest groups that are forming and still forming and evolving within uh, different institutions, 68 nationally so far, IR symposia, 13 regional, and medical uh, student in training pairing with fac faculty member uh, program that we have, and then expanded educational offerings, clinical procedural research innovation, kind of as a broad uh, categorization here, survival guides, which we'll talk about, journal primers, practice building, clinical topic webinars, uh, interactive lecture series, figure one cases, we talked about this previously, and then we also expand collaboration with other uh, uh, societies, ACR, Canadian um, Interventional Radiology Association, and, and SIR service lines, and that's the main Society of Interventional Radiology Service Lines, um, as I made an example earlier with the dialysis intervention. Um, so those are opportunities for trainer, uh, trainees to get involved with, with the attendings directly. Um, the, uh, and, and obviously one of, the, uh, one of the important aspects is advocacy, which is not so clinical or procedural, but it's very important for us to be politically aware. So that's, that's another uh, accomplishment we've had in the past year with congressman site visits and SERPAC, which we'll discuss shortly. And as I mentioned previously, um, there's going to be an online application process this year, which is a new development for trainees to be able to apply and uh, join us. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first committee chair, um, Kyle Wilson for the Medical Student Council. So Kyle. Hello. Uh, thank you guys for joining us this evening. My name is Kyle Wilson. Uh, I'm a third year medical student at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. And uh, on the next slide, you can see the number of uh, medical students that uh, have applied for and are actually part of the Medical Student Council. Uh, we have, uh, I believe, just over 50 members uh, in, in the council this year, 34 of whom are new. Uh, in the small all uh, graphs depicted off to the right of this slide, you can actually see the number of uh, uh, 
trainee members of SIR, and at the bottom in the dark uh, blue color, uh, you can see the number of medical students. And one of the things that we're really proud of on the Medical Student Council is that the number of medical student members of the society has really increased these past few years. We went from, I believe, around 600 in the um, 2014 to 2015 cycle to now over 1,100. Um, and our goal is to keep increasing that number over the next few years. Uh, I've invited a couple of my subcommittee chairs to actually speak about the goals of their committee and the um, uh, what they're going to be doing over the course of the next year. So I won't step on their toes uh, at the moment. I'll just let them talk about their committee. So uh, on the next slide, we have uh, a depiction of the number of IR interest groups and regional symposia that have taken place over the past couple of years. And I invite Bill Zhao to uh, talk to us a little bit about the goals of the IR Interest Group Committee over the next year. Hi, everyone. My name is Bill. I'm a third year at UCLA in Los Angeles. I'm one of the incoming IRIG committee chairs, taking over for Gero, who's done an amazing job with our committee. Uh, if you take a look at the bar graphs for the number of IRIGs and symposium, I apologize for not being there in person, but I will give you a brief introduction to our committee. Our purpose of committee is just to increase awareness of IR and medical schools uh, using interest groups. We help create interest groups at schools that don't already have them. We keep updated information on existing interest groups. We stratify interest groups by education opportunities um, and disseminate information to help improve existing IRIGs. Our past projects include creating guides on how to start an IRG, how to, a guide on how to start a local symposium, and map of IRGs from across the country, which can all be found on the SIR website. Our goals for next year are threefold. Number one, we want to continue with our IRG tracking from across the country. We want to increase our census to 75 schools. We want to have more detailed annual surveys to identify IRGs that are struggling. And we want to identify schools with uh, SIR residents and fellows and attendings, but no IRIGs, so we can help start IRIGs at those schools. Our second goal is to continue with our ongoing process with our the IR symposiums. We want to increase our number to 15 annual events. We want to increase our publicity of existing symposia to encourage inter-school attendance and to continue our IR local regional conference survey, which we're working on, to gather data on the success of these symposiums. Our last goal is to start a quarterly IRIG newsletter that to feature innovative IRIGs from across the country, as to give ideas to other groups and to recognize those who are excelling. Uh, thank you for listening, and I hope you guys will consider applying to our committee. All right, uh, thank you, Bill. And next up, we have uh, Rebecca Lee, who represents our Education and Research Committee, to talk about the goals of that committee. myself. Hi everyone, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, like as, uh, Kyle said, my name is Rebecca. I am the current chair for the Education and Research uh, Committee and I will be taking over um, for the upcoming year. Um, our overall goals are, as a committee, is to um, develop resources to increase medical student awareness about interventional radiology and to also help students who are presenting research um, to yeah help students who are um, doing research presentations to um, help build their professional skills so that they look great at um, conferences that they go to and um, presenting abstracts, etc. So some of the goals that we have for the upcoming year include resource, resource expansion. So we have four subcommittees in the Education and Research Committee and we're all working together to make sure that we can generate tons of resources so that medical students can be really aware of what's going on in interventional radiology and hopefully attract more people into the residency. And so some ideas that we have include uh, doing article reviews about the newest IR innovations and why they're important for patient, patient care, um, including a mentoring public speaking sessions and developing um, successful tips and guidebooks for interventional radiology presentations. And also we want to expand the simulator experience so that more students can actively learn what an IR life might be like. And actually this program is going to be available in Vancouver, so if you're there, um, definitely check it out. And um, of course, any questions, uh, feel free to uh, reach out and um, 
come and talk to me at Vancouver. You're going to be there. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. So um, the final slide for uh, us on the Med Student Council is just a list of our goals uh, for the upcoming year for the various committees. Uh, we've already heard from Bill and Rebecca about the goals of the IR Interest Group Committee and the Education and Research Committee, so I'm just going to speak very briefly about our goals for our PR and Communications Committee and our new committee focused on patient and family-centered care. For our PR and Communications Committee, we want to expand to 1,500 SIR medical student members, which I think is eminently possible given uh, our numbers over the past year. Um, we want to try and 250 students registered for SIR 2017, which will be taking place in Washington, D.C., and we also want to begin a case of the month Twitter project. For our new committee, Patient and Family-Centered Care, uh, we have a few resources uh, on this subject available on our website. Uh, but we want to expand the resources that are available to include eight patient narratives of what it's like for our patients to actually live with the diseases that we're helping them cope with. And we also want to include videos of pre- and post-procedural clinical visits, which are becoming increasingly important in the field of interventional radiology um, uh, as we try to uh, recruit and keep and follow our own patients. Um, so that's all from the Med Student Council this evening. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kyle. Um, just want to remind the uh, att attendees that if you have questions, you can address them using the chat box. So, and uh, we're monitoring it. So, if you have any questions, go ahead and type it in, and we'll answer it. Uh, next up is our clinical education chair, uh, Lindsay Thornton. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Lindsay Thornton. I'm the incoming chair taking over for the, uh, the Clinical Education Committee for Joanna Key Sampson. The overall purpose of the Clinical Education Committee is to educate RFS members on IR-related topics, provide resources to aid members in navigating clinical and IR rotations, especially in light of the new IRDR residency, and educate the larger medical community about IR. Um, we have a number of projects to facilitate this. Um, current projects include Case of the Month series, our research lecture series, which we started recently in the past year, um, monitoring the, uh, and um, encouraging webinars, webinar presentations, um, and incorporating it into our YouTube channel curricula, uh, figure one present, uh, postings, and um, our new clinical lecture series, which um, is up and coming this year. Uh, joint projects with the Membership Council include Survival Guides, Journal Primer, and the IR Practice Building Project, and um, we have a joint pro project with the Communications Committee um, regarding social media, which uh, they will talk about later. So on the next slide, um, you'll see a sampling of a few of the webinars held in the past year. Um, members approach faculty um, to, to give webinars on a variety of subjects, including research, advocacy, traditional IR topics, um, and or updates on these topics, and even um, uh, off the beaten path type of presentations like building social media program, which we had with Matt Hawkins um, earlier this year. So um, on the YouTube channel, you'll find different playlists um, to fulfill different learning objectives according to um, our general curricula, as you'll see on the next slide. So if, uh, if you, we started this channel in 2011, and if you have not used this resource, I strongly encourage you to do so by Googling um, IR Education and, um, and YouTube. So on the next slide, you'll see uh, bar graphs of the past four years. Um, that we've had the YouTube channel. Um, as you can see, uh, our viewership, uh, subscribers, and archive have increased over each year. And currently, we have uh, 508 total subscribers and 87 uh, videos, which include uh, videos on disease processes, procedures, journal clubs, didactic lectures, etc. cetera. Um, and we have, um, to date, well, I made this slide a couple couple last week, but uh, 20, 20, approximately uh, 21,500 views. So on the next slide you'll see um, another way we provide IR education is through the medical students, residents, and fellows who submit cases for the annual case competition. This past year, um, our case competition um, recruited 86 new cases. Um, three of which will be present presented at the annual meeting this year. The remainder of these cases are used for education. 
Um, so over the years, past three years, we've um, logged 203 cases. Last year we posted 36 cases in the form of uh, case of the month, so three cases uh, we upload to our website per month. This year to date we have posted 22 cases and this is secondary to our new posting um, and sharing in figure one which um, I'll touch on um, in a couple slides here. So in total we post three cases per month on our SIR website and one case per week on our figure one account. So on the next slide um, the, you'll see that if you log into our uh, website and uh, view case of the month. Um, the cases are presented as clinical uh, consultation with questions about diagnostic workup, image interpretation, procedural and periprocedural care. The next slide, um, here you'll see a screenshot of our figure one account. Um, figure one is another way we use these cases by sharing them with the greater medical community to increase awareness of what IR can do and um, use these to uh, educate those um, who may be less aware but also people who are interested in IR. So this is more of a IR quick hits, um, just a quick summary of the, the disease presentation with questions about what is the diagnosis and what's the best way to proceed with care and we post these every Monday and the answer is every Tuesday we're on a posting schedule. So um, in the past three months we posted 13 cases. Um, I think it's about 15 now since I've made this slide and we have 215 followers which has been impressive and um, we've also thanks to the social media um, committee for um, increasing this awareness. So moving on um, to the research lecture series, um, this was a series that we created in the past year um, due to a recognized need for the I, for IR bound res residents to supplement their research education, especially um, uh, especially at programs where they may not be as many resources uh, to be able to start projects and um, understand uh, the research process. So to date, we've had um, quite a few speakers. Uh, Dr. Aaron Jerry from Sloan Kettering um, gave our first introduction lecture, followed by Reed Omery at Vanderbilt. Um, we've even had a lecture by Ziv Haskell on how to get your paper published, and he is the editor of JVIR, so that was um, uh, a real treat for us. And Dr. Vendantham is the PI for the National Attract trial. Um, and he gave a lecture recently. Upcoming speakers, um, Dr. Geba is actually going to give a lecture later this week on translational research and Nelly Tan is going to give a lecture on Monday about a case-based review of biostatistics and Sarah White and Dr. Ryu later this year. So we're really excited about this project and getting this started. So moving on to um, IR practice building, this is a joint project with the Membership Council. And this project uh, was to help educate the greater medical community that we as IRs understand disease processes um, and to help suggest treatment options for uh, these patients who may be suffering from these diseases with the goal of changing referral patterns. So currently um, we've basically completed phase one for most of the disease topics. So we've created summaries of, um, of disease processes and why and how how IR contributes to the treatment of these diseases. Phase two, which uh, we're in the middle of and um, near completion for the initial uh, topics that we've selected. Um, basically, members will uh, conduct an evidence-based literature review um, for each of these disease processes they've been assigned um, and use the service lines um, as a resource to supplement their literature search um, and create a comprehensive PowerPoint. And the goal is to be able to present these PowerPoints to primary care physicians at grand rounds, morning reports, etc. And in the future, we hope that the, these PowerPoints will be a resource for uh, trainees and recent graduates to build their own practice. So um, we uh, hope that you'll be able to get involved in the clinical education committee. We have all these great projects uh, for the future and um, as I mentioned we have a new clinical lecture series which we also hope to expound upon in the next year. 
Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, great talk. Our next uh, committee is membership council and the service line. So go ahead, guys. Hey, everybody. Um, this is David Maldow. I'm the current vice chair of the membership council. Um, on behalf of myself and uh, Kevin Anton, who's the current chair, who unfortunately cannot be with us tonight, and Dan Shiloh, um, the outgoing chair, who uh, has done a phenomenal job this year. Uh, a lot of the projects we've been involved in uh, that are ongoing, a lot of their success can be attributed to him and um, Ali and everybody else here. So uh, we work as a team and very much appreciate uh, leaving us in good hands. Um, so just to give you an overview of the history of uh, the membership council, uh, this was founded in 2010 along with the development of the RFS. Um, soon after its creation, we adopted this service line structure uh, modeled after the larger attending-based service lines. And the overall goal of the membership council is to help uh, residents and fellows alike to become more educated and um, experts in specific disease processes, including um, clinical presentation, examination, workup, um, and a multi multidisciplinary approach to management of, of patients um, in addition to the specific interventions involved. Um, this was kicked off first with the vascular service line in 2012, and they hosted the first Angio Club, and things have taken off dramatically since then. Um, so uh, listed here is just uh, an example of the structure of our service lines. Um, the membership council has grown significantly over the last few years, and we now encompass six discrete groups. This includes the vascular service line, interventional oncology, uh, neurointerventions, pediatric interventions, pain management, and finally GI, GU, and reproduction. Um, these service lines are led by a chairperson with, um, as they're listed here, these are our newest chair per, uh, people, and um, some of the larger service lines have more chairs and are further subdivided into subcommittees, as the next slide shows um, for the vascular service line. Um, and uh, each service line has a different structure. Um, you know, we encourage autonomy and we, allow, we think that um, each, each person, each chair has a different um, leadership approach and um, we like to, you know, all work together and, and each service line will have a different style. But um, for some of the larger service lines like vascular, who have a lot of ongoing projects in addition to our core three projects, which I'll speak about, um, they have different chairs within their service line to help coordinate um, each of the projects and make sure everybody's on the same page and sort of act as liaisons within their service line. Um, so moving on, uh, some of the things before I get into our big three projects uh, are webinars, and these are ongoing throughout the SIR RFS, and um, is a, it's a great tool for us to help educate um, overall the um, ourselves and, and others. Um, it started initially, there's there's different types of uh, webinars that we that we do. Some are more specific and related to the procedure itself that we're doing, such as, for example, um, GI embolization, GU embolization, uterine fibroids, and others that are more on the management uh, of uh, conditions overall, like uh, Dr. Baddick and Cherry did on abdominal aortic aneurysms. Um, additionally, other different types of webinars are more focused on uh, practice building, um, and uh, both IR attendings and non-IR clinicians can give these lectures. Um, so these are a very wide range of, of webinars that hope to uh, help with didactic lectures versus technique versus, versus uh, focus on patient management. Moving forward, uh, there will be an emphasis to incorporate more even more of these non-IR clinicians as presenters uh, in, in order to integrate with the other medical services and, and coordinate, have us be, be better able to coordinate with them. And um, as we've alluded to throughout the presentation, um, a greater emphasis on, on the why over the how the procedure is done, um, taking into account the, the greater clinical picture. So um, as, I've, as I've mentioned, there are three major topics or, or uh, projects that we're involved in, uh, the first being the survival guide. Uh, this one is um, essentially the furthest along of our 
of our big three projects. And um, essentially, Survival Guide is in is overall um, designed to review, uh, essentially put together brief review of key procedures, pre-procedural procedural workup, um, including imaging, uh, the procedure itself, post-procedural care, and long-term follow-up. Um, so these still essentially serve as great references for medical students, residents, and even fellows um, possibly work rotating on IR. And the eventual goal is to create, um, now as, as we're completing this project, it's being posted up to the website, and we encourage you to check out all of the, the great content that's been posted so far. And as this project culminates, uh, we're looking to develop something in the longs of an app where um, we can, as junior residents, uh, can take a quick look to look at, for example, indications for this ablation or um, the INR guidelines and risks associated with this procedure. So uh, we're very excited about this. Um, we're uh, nearly completing, uh, it started with the Interventional Oncology Group, which started things off. And um, week by week, we're, we're getting closer to, uh, to, to its completion. Uh, moving forward is uh, the Journal Primer project, which um, essentially is designed to, uh, to find landmark or sentinel, sentinel articles, both within the IR field and in medicine in general. Um, the focus here is to, we're most interested in the best evidence um, rather than just the most recent evidence. And this also includes uh, looking outside of the IR literature uh, for those key articles. And uh, most recently, for example, new anticoagulation guidelines or um, the new sepsis guidelines. So these are things, again, along the lines of us um, being clinicians and knowing the disease process. This should help us go a long way towards that. Um, uh, an example of something that we've done uh, is the neuroservice line is if you check on the website, they've posted uh, several key articles on stroke thrombectomy, uh, such as Mr. Clean and several others. Uh, over the last several years, there's been several uh, landmark trials and articles that have come out, and the neuroservice line's done a fabulous job summarizing those. Um, so I encourage you to look at those and all the others that are up on the service line. and um, site, excuse me, and several more to come with that. Um, our other third, one of our third and final big project that all of us in collaboration are working on as service lines is the IR practice building. And I know Lindsay uh, of the Clinical Education Committee went into, went into detail about this, and um, us as the membership council are working on um, getting this educational content going. So. Um, in a lot of ways, Membership Council works to use all these educational tools and develop uh, kind of like the workhorse of, of us uh, working to get these, uh, these educational tools out there and learning a, a whole lot along the way. Um, so as Lindsay had said, this is emphasizing the underlying disease process and us acting as um, being able to discuss with referral clinicians, non-IR clinicians. Um, such as, for example, postpartum hemorrhage, uh, the etiology, the diagnosis, and the management of that, or portal, portal hyper, hypertension. Um, understanding from, from the start of the, of the disease process to the eventual possible IR procedure, um, how to go about managing the patient. And um, to develop this, or to move this along, we've developed uh, some liaison positions within our service lines that are helping to coordinate within, um, within all the service lines to make sure everybody is on the same page. Um, so there's been a lot of streamlining uh, lately um, between all these three projects and uh, the service lines are working together to uh, make sure that we have the most accurate and important content um, out there. And so far it's been a great, been a great start. Um, in addition to these big three, I'll just touch on uh, some other small things. Uh, aside from those, the service lines have their own projects, which they're out of their own interest are are working on. And so, uh, for example, um, the uh, vascular service line has a trauma subdivision, 
And so um, going back to autonomy, I think each service line has that opportunity to, um, to focus on their preferences and, and I encourage you to um, reach out to them if, if you have a particular interest in getting involved, um, that would be fantastic. Um, so um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, in addition, just one last thing, uh, several journal clubs are ongoing um, each month. They have throughout the year. Uh, these can be smaller group discussions or topic-specific forums. And uh, Angio Club as well, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have an April Angio Club on complex upper extremity and lower extremity interventions um, through the vascular service line. And um, cases will be submitted until, four, until April 1st, at which point uh, they will be narrowed down and cases will be presented. Um, so a lot of exciting things going on. And um, we have a, a great web presence uh, on the website in addition to others. Um, such as Wikipedia, um, we're editing, updating Wikipedia pages and um, various things like that. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll say thank you for listening and uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions and I hope to see you either at SIR in April or um, along the way as a member of our group. So thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Kevin. Appreciate it. Um, just want to, again, I want to uh, emphasize if anybody has any questions, please use the chat box um, and we'll be sure to answer it. Um, also, previous chairs, if there's anything uh, you'd like to uh, stress, please go ahead and interject at any time. Um, next up, we have uh, Andrew Niekamp from University of Texas Houston. He's our communications chair. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, like, uh, like Ali just said, uh, my name is Andy DeCamp. I'm a R1 down here in Houston. Um, we manage the communications committee, and the uh, biggest focus of our group is basically to synthesize all the information that the RFS has and uh, broadcast it to you guys to make sure that all of our members are up to date and aware of the different functions and uh, the different sort of um, gatherings that we have going on. So um, the first big thing that the uh, communication committee kind of tackles is the IR quarterly. And uh, the IR quarterly was started in 2013 by SIR, actually, and um, it's a magazine that communicates updates that's critical to the practice of IR. Um, but they also have different stories, interviews, and um, other issues that they publish um, each quarter to kind of keep their members up to date. Um, as the RFS, we are fortunate in each of their issues to have a certain section. And over the past year, we've had some great articles. Um, in the summer, we focused on the um, Fellow Spring Practicum, which was basically a fellow-based article. Um, fall, we focused on early career research. Um, winter was innovation in IR. And then actually, this upcoming spring, so uh, be looking for this article, we're focusing on the IR residency update, which is actually going to be a really exciting article. We have a lot of collaboration between Dr. Prad Patel, who's up in um, Medical College of Wisconsin, and who's also been extremely involved with the ACGME, getting the IR, um, DR residencies and the integrated residencies, independent residencies, as well as ESIR off the ground. So we've got some really great people contributing to this article, um, and that'll be getting released sometime in spring. Uh, so those are, that's one of the big interesting things that the um, committee has going on. The next big topic that we uh, do is our IR quarterly in training. It's our um, e-newsletter. So each quarter we try to have, along with IR quarterly, we try to have uh, six articles that get published that are written by our members. Uh, we try to have three written by the residents, and then we also try to have three written by the medical students. And these articles really can uh, vary from interviewing a faculty member to something that you're passionate about. Um, Ali has actually written a couple articles about the importance of advocacy and the um, SERPAC. And then this uh, past article, our residents wrote a collaboration piece on the importance of ICU training. So we kind of try to create um, some sort of a topic or overarching theme for each of our e-newsletters. But these are um, really unique chances to get your voice out there. Um, if there's something you're passionate about, and we always we release this each quarter, and there's always a little help one in this section. So um, you know, anybody that's in the RFS has an opportunity to write an article, and we very much encourage um, your participation. Also included in the e-newsletter is just a little upcoming events that uh, talks about all of the 
webinars and everything that's coming. Um, and Lindsay briefly mentioned this in the um, Clinical Education Committee. Um, the whole social media aspect of the RFS was actually started in the Clinical Education Committee and is slowly being transferred over to the Communications Committee. And we're going to be actively managing this. Um, we have a very um, active Twitter account. We also have an Instagram account. And then the Figure One account, Lindsay talked about earlier, um, mostly run by the Clinical Education Committee as they are in charge of the case competitions and they're able to put up many cases daily. Um, that's the ultimate goal is to have the cases on there. But um, we have many followers on Twitter and we're constantly providing very up-to-date information to trainees actually regarding um, our next big item is going to be during the application season for medical students in the upcoming year. We're going to be trying to tweet um, live ERAS updates because of the new IR residency. So uh, really trying to keep everybody up to date um, with the latest and greatest information. A um, little more detail on our social media account. Um, on the following slide, you'll be able to see that we actually have, um, this is our main Twitter page. Uh, as you can see over here, just a little, some of the examples of things that we're posting. Um, and then as we're able to manage the Twitter page as well as the uh, figure one account, we are able to kind of cross broadcast and promote our cases in the, uh, in the figure one's accounts. And then if we can go to the next slide, um, just a little couple stats and data regarding the Twitter accounts. We actually have 769 followers. Um, we're, we've been retweeting very prominent IR handles. Um, if any of you follow us, you'll notice that Mount Sinai and IR, um, MUSC, Vanderbilt, um, Rush, these are all very active in the social media. And IR as a whole, uh, as a specialty, is starting to become extremely active in social media. And we're trying to stay at the forefront of that. And I think the committee that we've assembled is actually doing a phenomenal job. Um, figure one postings, like I've already talked about, we're trying to post a case weekly. Um, and then you know, original tweets. Um, we're, this is going to get very active during Vancouver. We're actually um, look for updates coming there. We're going to have a meeting with the social co uh, social media committee to kind of create a coordinated effort to make sure that we are very active during SIR in Vancouver coming up. Um, we also advertise journal primers. We also advertise um, webinars, and then uh, conferences are very important too. Uh, last thing is just basically a, um, this is kind of the catch-all that the communication committee kind of does behind the scenes. Um, we are the responsible committee for all webinar coordination. Um, all the individual service lines and committees set up their own webinars and go to meetings, but we're in charge of making sure that there's uh, not a conflict. And then we also collect a lot of data regarding um, how many attendings we have, who participated, um, you know, how active was the conversation, kind of a lot of data that the society actually wants as a whole. Uh, we're also in charge of the website, um, and we have our dedicated webmasters who constantly keep our web page updated with the most up-to-date information. Um, we actually have a link on there uh, that talks about as new residencies, IR residencies, both independent and integrated, as well as ESIR programs come online. We're actually keeping our website the most up-to-date um, with what programs have been approved and what are available to not only medical students but also to residents regarding the ESIR pathways. So uh, keep an eye out for that. We actually have a link, uh, a member of SIR who is constantly keeping us updated with that information. And then the uh, Google Groups, which I know that all of you have received emails from us. Uh, that is the communications committee that manages the Google Groups and the Google Gmail. So we're constantly keeping you updated for um, webinars, and then if anyone doesn't know what Sir Connect is, um, it is a basically a a web broadcasting thing that the society has um, just kind of put together on its own. And I encourage you to Google it after this and sign up for SIR Connect. Uh, it's a great way to keep up to date with the things that not only the RFS posts but the committee as a whole posts as well. So um, with that, I just want to thank you. I look forward to getting all of you um, involved with the communications committee that are interested. And if you're ever interested in writing an article, please let us know and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you, Andy. Um, next up is Advocacy Committee. Um, I'm, uh, I, I'm the previous chair of Advocacy Committee, um, and uh, the current chair was not able to make it, so I will 
um, go over some of the stuff I've done. We our committee did in the past um, year. Try to be, make it concise and informative. This is our future chair, um, Alex Misono. Unfortunately, he was traveling. Um, so quickly, uh, there is a political uh, aspect of interventional radiology, which affects um, the the legislation that 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 will ultimately define our specialty um, when it comes to pretty much everything: the technical fee, the professional fee, um, what, uh, with regards to um, reimbursements, and um, obviously reimbursements translating into uh, patient care. Um, and um, there is a uh, political action committee, a PAC, uh, that is uh, specific to SIR. And I just wanted to quickly give uh, everyone um, an idea of what this is, um, since it's not very clinical um, and a lot of people don't have exposure to it. Basically, SIR, um, Society of Interventional Radiology, is the only entity that advocates for IR. And SIRPAC um, and SIR work together, even though they're separate entities, they work together to basically um, influence the government into making certain laws, uh, you know, be good for IR, basically. SERPAC helps us build relationship, relationships with lawmakers to shape the future of medicine. And, and you would ask, how does it work? Basically, each member of Congress has a fundraiser called um, a, a, a PAC. A fundraiser is, is a person that they hire, and that person will basically collect money for them, for them to be able to do the things they want to do in office, including re-election. SERPAC contributes to the PACs of these congressmen and women, um, thus buying access and time uh, for them to hear us and talk about the changes that are happening to healthcare and the, and the ways we want to have IR shape into the future of medicine. Um, so a lot of it, uh, a lot of the advocacy that goes on in DC, unfortunately, is based on money. And um, that's a topic nobody wants to ever really talk about because that means you know, we're asking people to contribute. And that's that's part of what SERPAC is, is um, working working towards members' contributions and increasing them. Um, the reason that's, that's important is because, it, like I said, it gives us access to be able to speak to these lawmakers. Um, there's, cer there's certain ways that SERPAC works to accomplish those goals on a training level and an attending level. Um, this is just a picture of uh, the uh, group of residents that visited a congressman last year and were able to speak about the um, new IR residency, for instance. That's one of the things we talked about. 100% um, of the money raised by SERPAC goes directly towards the candidates. None of the membership dues go to SERPAC. SERPAC will require a separate contribution. Um, and they have a website, and that's, uh, that's, what, that's the platform they use. Um, how do we spend the money? Like I said, distribute the money to federal candidates who are either pro-IR health or pro-health care who can help us with a particular issue. Money goes towards current members of Congress and candidates seeking re-election and, and or election. Um, there are four major committees of jurisdiction within the U.S. government that Interventional Radiology PAC, aka SERPAC, targets, and that's Ways and Means Committee, Energy and Commerce, Senate Finance, Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Um, and that those are the four committees that we try to work with, aka contribute to contribute to their members, their congressmen, their senators, um, and House members, uh, in order to get them to basically listen to us. So it's a very important aspect of IR that everyone needs to know about. Just quick examples of the things that SERPAC has done in the past. Um, I'll just go over the bold. We advocated to help avert a 41% cut to IR reimbursement through the CHAMP Act of 2007. Um, we uh, SERPAC. Uh, helped in reducing drug shortages in 2011, advocated to create a bill that would provide additional funding for medical research and the treatment of uterine fibroids, and also advocated to have IR recognized as its own primary specialty, which is a check that's done, and get more residency spots for IR um, residency. And that comes from the overall money that the federal government, as we all know, allocates and appropriates to different residency programs. And there's a lot of politics when it comes to how many spots are given to any specialty. And especially with a new specialty, we have to put up a huge fight to get those spots, to have the money to be able to fund this IR residency and constantly expand it, as we've been discussing, which is one of the main missions of RFS is promote the IR residency. So this kind of ties into the mission. So it's very, very important, deep rooted. Just quick numbers um, from uh, uh, a uh, no, just from a number standpoint here. The American College of Radiology, as you can see, 
on the top, the, the bottom left here, you can see contributions to the PAC in 2014, about a million, million seven hundred thousand. Um, to the right, Society for Vascular Surgery, um, you can see they have 152,000, 161,000, um, and total receipts up top 206,000. So um, if you look at their total receipts numbers here, 200, 206,000 here, 2 million for ACR. So ACR is a, is a million dollar pack. Vascular Surgery, Society of Vascular Surgery, which has less attending members and trainee members, still has a lot more money than SERPAC, Society of International Radiology, is sitting at 102,000. And these numbers are updated every two years based on the uh, the terms of the Congress, which is two years for a house. And <clears throat> so this this is why it's the only time. So for the past two years, we've had 102,000 in, in total, the, the money that was basically donated to us through membership and uh, other parties. Um, some of the ways that trainees can get involved in promoting SERPAC is uh, basically getting in front of the congressman and or woman. And the way we do that is we, there's a program called the Grassroots Leadership Program, which was the, the second year that it was done was last year. And there's some pictures there of the uh, residents that went. That was, that's DC and the front of the fountain in front of the Capitol. And then in, inside a congressman's office at the, in the House. Um, basically, uh, there's a list of uh, congressmen that we, that we uh, sat down and discussed different interventional radiology aspects um, when it, uh, with regards to, again, getting more residency spots. There is a bill called the GME bill that the SERPAC um, uh, attorneys have uh, submitted, which we're looking for sponsorship. This bill basically will get us more spots. How do, how, how do we get more spots? Is again, we convince the government to allocate more money, and that requires the government to take money away from certain specialties and give it to us because the, because in, in government, they want to have something called budget neutral, which basically means no money can be added. We have a budget, and you just have to fight for it, which is what makes SERPAC so important uh, for us to support so we can have a stronger voice in government, uh, which essentially makes all the decisions. Um, last year, some numbers from the trainee perspective. Um, we, only, we had 20 donors, 28 donations, about $1,300, um, which was 8% of the contributions um, and 4% of the money donated. That number um, definitely needs to increase on a trainee level, and um, our job as advocacy uh, committee members and overall, I feel like advocacy is something that everyone's part of um, because it doesn't really focus on a specific project, whether it's vascular or neuro. It's a project that everybody has to really think about and push it in, in, within their attendings. Um, I recently spent a week doing an ACR version of the grassroots leadership program called the Rutherford Fellowship, and it gave me a really good insight on how ACR does it. And the way ACR basically does it, as far as collecting the $2 million that they do every two years, is they have so many different platforms pushing through so many different levels, trainees, students, and attendings. They assign uh, students, um, they assign residents within programs to be advocates and speak to their attendings and get them to basically donate. They assign attendings within uh, practices to be the voice of advocacy and you know, convince their peers uh, within reason and with example to donate more to their PAC and uh, so many different levels. And those are, those are some of the goals that the advocacy committee is having um, to deal with to get m members more engaged. Another thing that um, <clears throat> I was actually able to do this year, and I know the, the previous chair before me, Paul Rotula, was able to do in Vermont, uh, was getting a congressman uh, to visit. This is, this is Congressman Marshall Blackburn. She actually goes by congressman. Um, I was able to uh, convince her to come to our hospital and, uh, you know, along with my attendings, you know, go over some anatomy, um, uh, go over some basic interventional radiology teaching, um, showing her what, you know, a, a catheter is, a wire, this or that, um, and uh, she was able to basically view a kyphoplasty procedure, discuss a uterine fiber embolization, discuss pain management, um, and especially interventional radiology role, she was very interested in the chronic pain management, um, which is a huge deal right now on the Hill with regards to opioid uh, abuse um, and people getting addicted to heroin. So that's something that, um, again, it's great to meet with a congressman because you can actually understand what they're worried about and be like, hey, by the way, interventional radiology can help in this way. Now, I'm not saying we can help with every political medical issue, 
But in this case, we can't. Um, and actually, my attending uh, with the white coat, he actually has a pain clinic here in Memphis. So he was able to really kind of go to go to town with the answer on that. So she was very happy. Again, you know, she'll go back to Washington and get, um, you know, followed up with the SERPAC lawyers and the members uh, at, 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 at obviously a higher level than trainees. And, you know, they can use this as, as a weapon and say, hey, you know, uh, my our resident, for instance, you know, uh, came, you know, you went and visited and kind of follow that conversation and just be, be more um, connected, basically. Um, recently, we did a advocacy webinar, um, just similar to this webinar, um, to kind of educate everybody about advocacy, go into more detail that I'm not going in today, with regards to education, awareness, legislation, and why numbers matter. So you can actually go to our IR Education um, YouTube page that several other chairs have mentioned, and just search for the SIR for us uh, at SERPAC Advocacy Webinar and watch it. Um, we also uh, communicate, again, IR Quarterly has been mentioned before. This is Paul Rotula, one of the, uh, the the first chair of Advocacy Committee, actually, and the previous one before me. He wrote a very, uh, very great, very good article on Campaign 400, which was basically talking about if every every attending member and every stu every trainee member essentially gave $400 a year, we would basically double to triple the uh, biannual money that we have for SERPAC. So that's why we call it Campaign 400. I've actually written a follow-up article for this next IR quarterly um, article regarding advocacy that kind of follows up on his article. So look out for that. And uh, definitely consider uh, becoming active when it comes to advocacy and interventional radiology. Um, <clears throat> some upcoming goals, uh, grassroots leadership program that we talked about happens once a year. As of now, there's really no limit to how many uh, trainees and or students uh, want to uh, basically attend. Uh, you will be flown to DC. You will be given uh, three to four nights at hotel, all complimentary dinners. Normally you have with a congressman or there's always an event that you're doing. So it's, it's a very fun uh, event during the day from nine to five. You're basically hanging out at the, at the Senate and the House and basically pushing, pushing issues that you're being trained to do. Um, <clears throat> another big goal is engaging members. Like I said, why it's important, basically have to get people to donate and, and strengthen our pack versus ACL and vascular surgery, which are our biggest competitors. They're the ones that are making decisions right now over IR because we're not the biggest guys at the table. Um, advocacy toolkit for trainees, um, uh, just kind of a gu guideline of how to get trainees to become advocates and also site visits. Like I mentioned, it's uh, they're not that hard to uh, set up. Uh, just get it's, it's important to get in touch with your uh, congressman or woman and invite them over and the uh, SERPAC uh, organization can help you with that, with the communication there, and also advocacy committee will be able to assist you. So be creative once you uh, join this uh, committee, and or if you're not, just if you have any ideas, if you're not part of the committee, definitely contact um, uh, the committee chair. And that goes to all committees. You don't have to be part of any committee or service line. If you have an idea, just go ahead and you know contact us, and we'll we'll point you in the right direction. So um, that's uh, that's for the advocacy. Our next uh, section is going to be our annual meeting. So I'm going to go ahead and hand that over. Claire, Chad, Kyle. Hey, Ali, actually, I'm going to be talking about the uh, oh, that's right, Andrew. Go annual ahead. meeting. Uh, yeah. um, so uh, basically, every year for the annual meeting this year in Vancouver, last year in Atlanta, um, the there's two members who are in charge of planning the RFS and the residence student curriculum that goes along with the uh, annual meeting. And it's becoming more integrated every year. It's uh, becoming more recognized and um, really becoming a powerhouse of the annual meeting. And um, so as you can see in the following slides, it's a there's two chairs. It's a uh, two-year commitment. And there's always two residents that run it. And one is always a senior, one's always a junior. And this kind of... Um, the reason we do this is to kind of make sure that there's always um, a mentor and a mentee planning that way that whoever takes over the next year has done it before and they're able to train somebody behind them. That way there's kind of this cohesive um, method to making sure that everything gets planned and goes smoothly because it's a pretty huge um, commitment once you take this on. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of coordination. Um, what we do is we plan the entire curriculum. We get speakers for the resident and training program. Um, we also organize the resident and training and the medical student in training dinner. Those are the um, scholarship winners for the resident and training scholars as well as the um, medical student. Um, 
We also plan the uh, Synergy Dinner, which we have uh, two keynote speakers this year who are going to be talking, and um, which is a really great event that we put on every year. We also screen applications for the RIT scholarship. So everyone that submits an application, the uh, co-chairs go ahead and screen through and make sure that we have um, the best applicants getting the getting the scholars. Um, we work very closely with the SIR and industry, and we also organize an exhibit hall uh, tour. Um, the case competition is also a very important thing that we're in charge of. Um, I know that uh, Lindsay talked about this earlier, but the case competition, the actual winners get to present at SIR um, in Vancouver, and we actually help screen those applications as well and select the judges who are going to be taking over and um, eventually picking the winners who have the privilege then to present at the annual meeting. Uh, this slide right here is just a um, little diagram showing the applications that we've had for the annual meeting. Um, this year in Vancouver, we're back up to 136, and then the medical students actually started in 2013, and we went from 45 just two years ago, and we're all the way up to 91, so we've almost doubled in, um, doubled in applications for medical students, and we expect those numbers to keep going up as IR becomes more of a prevalent, um, becomes more of a prevalent specialty. Um, and on, then on the next slide, um, the annual meeting data, this is just kind of a um, this is just kind of a brief diagram showing you that each year we continue to increase in the amount of trainees we have that are attending. So um, as the co-chairs, you know, it becomes more and more of a uh, more and more of a pressure to make sure that this curriculum runs smooth, that there's uh, plenty of opportunities for the trainees to be able to attend and to really get everything they can out of the annual meetings. And that's all we have. All right. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate it. Next up, we have uh, women in IR uh, committee. Uh, Natosha couldn't make it, so I will uh, go over her committee for her. Uh, basically, this committee was reestablished in 2015, um, and it was approximately 30 members and uh, obviously climbing. Um, it focuses on mentorship, uh, and it uses uh, publishing Q&A articles in the IR quarterly and training column, uh, and she's done... Uh, several uh, Q&A articles so far by uh, several different positions, Dr. Ann Roberts from UCSD, Nishida, uh, Dr. Nishida Kothri from Stanford, Dr. Laura Findus from University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And uh, she's done several webinars uh, that focus on women in IR um, called Practical Approaches to Radiation Safety with Dr. Carrie Campbell Corner, um, University of Oklahoma, um, up and, and upcoming webinars on radiation and pregnancy, Dr. Marks from USC. And I know that Antosha is very passionate about this committee, and uh, obviously she'd love to work with uh, any future members. And uh, that is uh, a quick summary of her slides. Uh, next up, we have uh, IR Residency uh, Training Committee. And I believe Dr. Katarpal is speaking. Thanks, Ali. And thanks, everyone, again, for coming out this evening. Uh, my name is Akhil, and I'm an R2 at VCU in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm the current vice chair elect for the IR Residency Training Committee. Um, Alex Joe from the University of Michigan is serving as our chair for the committee. So this is a very busy and exciting time for our committee as uh, we're heavily involved with the transition to the new IR residency, residency training pathways, and we have an awesome group of active members that work to help create and distribute relative information during this time. So on the next slide, I'm going to go over our broad goals as a committee. So we aim to develop a truly integrated curriculum and provide educational resources for IR and DR residents who hope to become cl clinically oriented physicians. And that's a huge point of emphasis, like you've heard um, throughout tonight, uh, clinically oriented physicians. We aim to distribute up-to-date information regarding the new IR training paradigm and all available IR training opportunities in the nation. And we aim to serve as the primary contact and resource regarding the new IR integrated residency independent residency, and early specialization in interventional radiology, aka the ESIR program. So on the next slide, I'm going to go over some of our specific uh, current active projects. So one big thing we do um, is we are constantly providing updated information regarding the IR residency. An example of this is uh, a frequently asked questions document that was created related to the IR residency. And this is a document that we have available on the SAR website, and it addresses the common questions that are arising during this transition time in IR training. Um, we're addressing things such as, you know, why this uh, new residency is developed and why it's becoming a separate primary medical specialty, 
how the IR residency is different from the previous IR training pathway, such as the clinical pathway, the direct pathway, and a traditional uh, fellowship route. Um, we have a lot of questions just relating to what is actually entailed in the IR integrated and independent residency pathways, as well as the ESIR. And also we talk about what's going to happen to the current IR fellowships, which are all a bunch of questions that a lot of folks are very interested in learning about during this time. Um, another one of our projects shown on the next slide is uh, providing updated information regarding VSAS. So we combined all national IR and DR clerkships uh, opportunities into an online database and made it available for medical students to use as a reference when looking, uh, looking at away rotation opportunities. And this provides information such as the clerkship location, contact information, which programs use VSAS, which ones have independent application processes. And also we have a cool feature which is a detailed description of the clerkship experience and what um, students are actually learning on that clerkship and what they're expected to do. Um, so on the next slide, a big project that we're currently working on as well is the universal curriculum for IR-related clinical rotations. So we're all very passionate about ensuring that we are trained to provide optimal patient care and believe this is a great way to help achieve that goal. So what we are doing is we are creating documents that provide a detailed description of IR-related clinical rotations, such as the ones that are listed on the slide, that outline the expectations and learning objectives residents should have during these rotations. So things such as a detailed explanation of what the resident should accomplish both in the inpatient and outpatient portion of relevant rotations is there. Uh, we highlight the disease processes that the resident should be comfortable managing from each rotation. And we also highlight how the resident can use their unique radiology skills to add extra value to the teams that they're on. So on the next slide, another project we are working on is creating a database on ESIR and integrated um, and independent IR residency programs. So what we've done is we've already sent out a questionnaire to all the program directors in the country about what their intended plans are for the new IR residency pathways. And we've collected this information and have it available on the RFS website with that link on the slide. And this is a great resource for students and residents who are pursuing IR to see what programs have the opportunities they're looking for um, in a residency available. And on the next slide, I'm just going to briefly talk about multiple ongoing projects that we're getting started up on this year and we're excited about working on this year as well. So one thing we want to do is create social media accounts for fast updates regarding the IR residency during the ERS application season. Um, we're developing a set of basic science grand rounds topics and presentations for cross-field clinical training. And we feel it's important as IR trainees to have a strong presence at multidisciplinary grand rounds to help establish our presence as clinical leaders and think this is a great way to help achieve that goal. We're developing a set of pre-rotation online modules for rotating M3 and M4 medical students and also junior residents to help them make the most of their IR clinical rotations. And we're also just constantly adding new projects based on member ideas and suggestions. So thanks for your attention, and I hope this helps you guys understand more about what we do and plan on doing in the IR Residency Training Committee. All right, thanks a lot, Akhil. Uh, our next committee is recruitment. Uh, go ahead and take it on, guys. Hey, guys, I'm Nikki Keefe. I'm R1 from UVA, and along with Farid Riyaz, we're um, heading up the recruitment committee. Um, as you can see on the next slide, our membership numbers uh, for global SIR members uh, that are medical students, residents, or fellows have tripled in the last six years, just kind of, kind of catering to the fact that med students and residents are getting more interested in going into IR, it's such an amazing field. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so we have the overall medical student, resident, and fellow members of SIR, but within that is the volunteer application uh, members. And those are the members that you see um, doing all of these exciting projects that everybody's presented so far. It's an online application, which we'll get to further, but normally we get this huge surge right after the annual meeting um, of everybody wanting to get involved in the RFS. We do accept applications 24-7, 365 days a year. Uh, it's an online application. You have a phone interview afterwards. During the application, you indicate which committees of the aforementioned committees are kind of the most interesting to you and what kind of projects you want to do in the future. And that allows us to help kind of put you in the right committees for both your interests and then what active projects we have going on. The governing council that's in charge of each one of these committees is a formal um, application process. This past year we had 23 applications for the 10 positions um, 
being in charge of the, the committees. Next slide. Um, as you can see, we have currently 235 active volunteer members in both the Medical Student Council and the RFS. So we have a lot of people um, running all of these exciting projects. We have 57 new members over the past year, um, which is up from the prior year of 53. So each year we're recruiting um, new bright minds to kind of uh, hit the ground running with these projects. Next slide. Um, we have traditionally always done a written application that you turn in online along with the CV. This year, actually last week, is the first time that we're doing an online application it's through a Google Doc. And it's, it's just a streamlined way to get all of the information um, from, from applicants easier and then through the system easier so that it's all in one place. Next slide. We do ask some questions, uh, CV questions on prior leadership activities, kind of what your ideas are on the interest of uh, IR and where the field's going in the future. And then again, we go through all the different committees and kind of where your interests lie. Next slide. Our goal for the next year is the implementation of this online application. And to, along with medical student Council working with the country, uh, helping to promote that. Each one of the new members that we accept to the RFS uh, is the hope that they will start an inter interest group at their school. Um, interest groups across the country uh, will help support them in developing local regional conferences. Um, and it's not necessarily, you know, in Boston, if you have like one school doing it, it doesn't mean every school has to do it, but to you know combine forces between all of those local IR interest groups to hold one great conference with each of their respective attendings uh, helping run the conference. Um, we want to make sure that our newly accepted members are actively engaged in their committees, you know, um, making sure that whatever committee they're in there participating in a project and fully immersed in the RFS. And then in the fall, we'll hold the second um, general council election for our next set of leaders in the RFS. Um, so we look forward to everybody joining the RFS or the Med Student Council. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Um, that was our last committee. I want to thank everybody for their presentations. Um, we do have one last slide. Uh, there was a question that was addressed um, regarding uh, student involvement in SERPAC. Uh, I think his name was, uh, I can't see his name, but the gentleman who asked, please email me and I'll point you in the right direction. And that kind of brings me to the uh, kind of final comments regarding uh, if you have any questions that you haven't asked during this presentation, please go ahead and yeah, email. You can email at sirrfs at gmail.com or you can just contact me directly if you'd like. And that's my email there. Um, we will have a RFS General Assembly and during the annual meeting in Vancouver um, later on this month. Um, I'm sorry, it's going to be uh, obviously uh, in April, sorry. And it's going to be from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. It's going to be on the schedule. So please join us there. Uh, we're not going to go uh, in depth uh, just like this presentation during that meeting with regards to uh, different aspects of RFS. I will give a shorter um, presentation and kind of use that time to mingle with uh, current members and uh, hopefully uh, future members. So please don't hesitate to, in the meantime, contact us um, using the emails on the screen and hopefully see everyone at the annual meeting. Uh, before we adjourn, uh, Dave Tabriz, the previous chair, I want to, do you have any any uh, final thoughts that you want to add uh, during your, uh, I guess, your experiences from last year and vision for the future? Dave? Um, no, I think uh, I want to thank all the um, RFS members for coming in and uh, just kind of getting, you're, you're, you're doing the first step by being here or watching this webinar to see kind of how the RFS is structured, what we're working on, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of change in the field with the residency and just, you know, you look at, <clears throat> as you had seen here through residency, just seeing uh, hiring practices by diagnostic radiology groups. <laughs> Clinical IR mindset has really uh, come to fruition. So uh, I applaud you guys for coming to this. Um, 
As for the incoming GC, I think you guys did a great job. Um, have a good for 2016-17, and uh, um, looking forward to seeing how everything goes. Thanks, Dave. Uh, thank you, everybody, again, and I look forward to working with you guys in the future. Uh, and if you have any questions, again, please contact us and see you guys at the annual meeting. Have a great night. Good night.